Welcome everybody with our new episode of our webinars. My name is Barry Kassab and I'm an MCA market development at Shure. Today's webinar is going to be handling the uh, entry or uh, the basics on how to be using uh, mixing desks. So a lot of the people have seen audio mi mixing desks. Uh, I know a lot of you are already using it. Maybe some of you have never used them yet. They're only using uh, studio interfaces, as in uh, uh, recording interfaces. Maybe some have used basic mixers. But today I'm going to go through mixing desks in general, starting from analog mixers, ending up with digital mixing desks. Now, the purpose of using a mixer or a mixing disc from the name of it is, is to be able to mix uh, sounds together to a, a narrower output or to a certain number of outputs. In most situations, it's either a single speaker in mono configurations or dual speakers as in a stereo configuration. Now, why, why are mixers sometimes hard to operate? Main reasons is that uh, generally, every manufacturer tries to do it their way. Every manufacturer thinks that he got the, the right logic to it. But in the past at least 30 to 40 years, uh, all the manufacturers uh, agreed on certain uh, configurations that is very similar to each other. So if you can operate a certain desk, you find yourself able to operate more desks than before. And the more you operate, these desks, the more easier it for you to, to, to understand the logic. There are still parts that are very uh, conservative or very proprietary to manufacturers that they try to, uh, let's say, do their own uh, routing algorithm or their own routing interface. Uh, some of them, they use a cross matrix kind of uh, routing interfaces. Some of them would use a, uh, a drop down menu. Uh, the other thing is that makes Digital mixer is a bit more complicated than analog mixers is that what you see on the surface is not what you see in, 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 the, in the hardware itself. So maybe the top level of the hardware, you still see the faders and few knobs on the top. But the thing is, all these can be altered to be something else by flipping into a different menu. So what happens is that the same interface that you can touch, feel, and use will be a totally different interface because of the ability to to maneuver that and, and to manipulate these uh, encoders. So a lot of the new digital interfaces right now, they are called touch surfaces. And the actual mixer is, is a software that is under the hood. So that kind of touch surface is just like a controller. So people who know what MIDI controllers are, the MIDI controller is not really a keyboard in terms, it's not really a, a, a instrument, it's just a encoder that the computer understands and then can translate that into a sound from the sound interface. So a media controller is just a touch surface. And then through that controller, you can manipulate all these buttons and keys to be something else. Now, a lot of the modern uh, digital mixers that are converting into this to become a touch surface or a control surface. Uh, and then a, uh, the, the brain of that mixer would translate that into something else. But the bottom line is that all the mixers share basics that are the same. It can be expanded or it can be reduced. So I'm going to run that through today in which by the end of this session today, everybody will be able to understand the logic of audio mixers, regardless if they are analog or digital. Okay. Now, uh, already I started the presentation here, so let's carry through this. So let's start with analog mixers. You know, I've chosen this picture today because it reminds me of the days when people used to ask me, do you know every single button and knob where it goes to? And of course, obviously the answer is yes, because it's it's all the same. But you know, for people who are starting in the industry and they're like still fresh, it feels like you're in a cockpit. So the, the logic of this, when it got analyzed and broken down into small segments, it starts to make a lot of sense to you, okay? So let's start with it. First, the, the, uh, what, what are these knobs and buttons and faders for, okay? 
So each one of those, if we slice them in a vertical uh, shape, it's called a channel strip. So if we strip it, literally take it out, it becomes a channel strip. So the multiplications of those are channels. So if you have a mixing desk with 32 channels, you will have 32 channel strips, okay? Now, what channel, what is inside the channel strip? A basic channel strip will have those points. First is your input ports. This is where you plug in your microphone, your instrument, your, your audio uh, source into the mixer. So it could be a TRS jack, which is a something that looks like this, quarter inch. It could be an XLR, usually it's a three pin kind of jack or plug, which is a balanced cable. Usually the jacks that goes into your uh, mixer is a TRS, so it's a balanced jack and it's not a unbalanced. But if you plug in an unbalanced jack, it still works. But of course, you're not gonna eliminate the noise anymore. That, like what we said in the previous webinars. So this is your input port. Additional to the input port, you have something called the insert patch. The insert patch usually is a TRS and usually it's unbalanced. What happens here is that it is a point where you can interrupt the input signal and send it out to an effect unit and bring it back in again to continue the signal path. So what happens is that you have a tip ring sleeve TRS. One will be sending the signal, one will be receiving the signal, and the shield is shared on both of them. This is very useful in the old days because in the old days, mixers did not have any effects on board. The mixer was a very pure analog mixer. The only thing that it had on board in terms of an effect was an equalizer, okay? And when I say equalizer, it was a parametric equalizer, just like we explained in last week's webinar. Now, after you go into the insert patch, back into the channel strip, the first thing comes in the way will be your input gain, okay? Now, some mixers would have the input gain before the insert patch. Some of them will have post. It's a manufacturer to manufacturer, but most of them will have that after the patch, okay? Now, the input gain, as we mentioned in the gain structure, webinar, this is where it, it dictates the sensitivity of your input. So based on how much signal you're getting in, this is how you adjust your input stage sensitivity and amplification level. <clears throat> After that, you get your equalization. Part of the equalization can be also a button, which is a high pass filter. If you're using a vocal mic or using a mic for the snare or for the toms, sometimes to save yourself a lot of equalization, you high pass filter it right away at 80 Hertz. So most of the manufacturers, they agree at 80 Hertz. Some of them will do 100 Hertz, but I never seen anything other than 80 Hertz as a high pass filter. So there's a button that goes right before the equalization. Could be sometimes next to the gain button. It's usually a high pass filter. Sometimes next to the gain, there's a button as well, which is a phase inverse. It's usually a circle with a sliced scratch that looks like a zero. Uh, this usually is a uh, out of phase uh, button that flips the direction of the signal. So the direction is going up, it makes it go down on the mixer. Or in another word, if the speaker is gonna go out of its place, the cone move out of its space, with the same direction of how the diaphragm on the microphone is going. So the diaphragm on the microphone is getting into a refraction of sound waves. So in that case, the vacuum will get, or the, the sound pressure will be less, so the vacuum. So the diaphragm of the microphone is gonna pop out and the speaker as well would do the same thing. So when you flip the phase, it reverses the movement of the speaker. So what happens if the, there is, uh, if the speaker is going to be creating a pressure when this, the sound pressure in the room is getting increased, it does the other way around. So that kind of idles the sound pressure level in the room and causes less feedback. On the other hand, if you're miking the same source from two different directions, 
one of the microphones has to be out of phase. Otherwise, you will can they will cancel each other. So when you're micing a snare from the top and the bottom, one of these microphones has to be out of phase. Now, there is a sure uh, uh, accessory that flips the phase. It looks exactly like this uh, adapter. So it has two, uh, it has two uh, kind of uh, plugs. It goes in the way of the, uh, uh, into the XLR. So you plug in your XLR into this, and then the other side goes into the mixer. So if your mixer doesn't have a phase inverter uh, button on it, you can use one of the Shure accessories, which is a phase inverter, inversion uh, accessory. Now, after that, which is part of the basic part of the equalization and the end of the gain structure, we go into equalization. As we mentioned last week, the sound that you are capturing is not always perfect. The room is not always perfect. The instrument is not always perfect. So you need to have equalization done on them. So the equalization here is, of course, varies from a mixer to another. It can be a basic bass, mid, and treble uh, pots or knobs. And it can be as advanced as a uh, paragraphic equalizer in some of the mixers. After the equalization, you get into a kind of a control matrix. Now that control matrix is different than your output matrix. This control matrix here allows you to send that particular channel to different auxiliaries. So the, when, when you send these specific channels to different auxiliaries uh, or effects, so usually they are on top of each other, it can be as low as a single auxiliary and a single effect or it can be two auxiliaries only, or two auxiliaries with one effect, depends on the mixer you're using, on how basic versus advanced it is. So what happens is that in this stage, you can control how much you want to send that particular input to an auxiliary, if it's going to a monitor or in your monitors, or how much you're gonna send that particular sound to the effects unit that you have, which is connected then to your main outputs. So you want to put in a reverb or a delay or a flanger or chorus on a vocals, you control how much you want to do that on every designated auxiliary. This is something you need to have done previously to your connections. So before you set up your mixer to be connected to your inputs, you need to set up your effects. So you know which aux is referred to what. Finally, here we have your output control on the channel strip which is the known fader that we push up and down. On top or next to it, you also have your group channels, which controls this. Uh, here is where you select your proper output matrix. So which output group is gonna go to which, or which output port is gonna be relevant to that input. So this also varies from a mixer to another. Most of the mixers would have something we call a VCA, voltage control amplifier, or in digital mixers is called DCA, digital control amplifier. It is the same thing, which you can group your outputs. In analog mixers, you have numbers. So you have group one and two, and then you have three and four, five and six, seven, eight, depends on how many groups you have. But most of these small to medium mixers would have at least two group outputs. This way you can segregate your uh, channels before it goes to your master output. So once you engage that in, then this group will control the output other than going to the direct output. Sometimes we use these groups on analog mixers to, to add more power. So if you, if you don't disable your master, so you have, let's say you have three buttons, your master button, and then you have your group one, two, and group three and four. So if you engage these groups, in addition to your output, you add more power to those uh, outputs. So what happens here, it helps you in not crossing the gain level. So you do not add more sensitivity. So it's a trick that a lot of the engineers do in the old days on analog mixers, but also can be done in digital as well. So this is a basic breakdown of a channel strip. Now, a channel strip looks exactly like this. 
as we can see a multiplication of these channels. So for example, here we have six channels. So this is, let's say a six channel mixer. Each one of those would have a channel strip that looks like this. On top, we have the input. Sometimes we have a linked input with a different input impedance. So this helps you uh, having a, a, an ability to accommodate high input impedance. The normal XLR or microphone input is rated at 600 ohms input impedance, while a example of using a guitar input that is in the multiplications of kilo ohms. Usually it's in a rate to 1.5 to 2 kilo ohms, maximum 10 kilo ohms. Then we have our uh, patch, which is the insert patch. So that is the first top. Right after that, we have the sensitivity or gain adjustment. After that, in some mixers, they have a compressor knob. And it's a very, very basic compressor knob. I know Yamaha mixers have a lot of these and some other manufacturers. But let's ignore that, which is right now uh, exposed here. Next to the gain, we have the uh, high pass filter button, which is the gray square. Uh, and then below that is the equalization, which is bass, mid, and treble. Some mixers would convert that to be a simple parametric EQ, which controls only the mid frequency. So you have an able to, ability to sweep the mid frequency only. And some of them would add even further more to mid frequencies, low mid and high mid. So bass, low mid, high mid, and then treble, and you can sweep those. But you cannot control the Q factor. So you cannot narrow it or add more width to it. After that, you have your effects and auxiliaries. So usually the auxes are the red knobs and the effects are the, uh, uh, the orange or yellow, depends on what color it's on the mixer. Below that is your panning uh, uh, knob. The panning is what dictates where is that channel gonna be located on your speaker system. So if you're using a stereo mix, you can control that particular channel to be positioned on your right. So from center to right on how much you turn that, or from center to left, depends on how much you turn that uh, switch. Some mixers would have a, a, that knob, sorry. Some mixers would have a switch. So this way it will only pan right or left. So 100% right or 100% left. So Small mixers usually, uh, or outboard mixers, like the ones they use with uh, uh, sound recordists or field recordists. Some of those mixers would have a switch. So this way you can actually simply record on the left or on the right completely. Some of those would have a knob as well to control that, but it's the same concept. After that, we have the groups, channels, mute, solo switches. Now, the mute and solo switches are tools. Uh, that an engineer needs to execute a mix either in live or in the studio. Sometimes when you have a lot of inputs, if you are unable to mute or solo the input, it gives you a harder day. Solo inputs only works on your headphones. So when you plug in your headphones, you are able to solo that input and hear it individually and know what's going on without disrupting or interrupting the output on the speaker. It's a very useful tool when you have feedback that occurs in the, in the mix, or when you are unable to isolate that sound from the PA system because of the amount of sound mixed up between the live band performing on stage and the main PA. So when you solo it, you will hear exactly what the microphone is hearing on that particular instrument. You are able to dictate the solo to be PFL, pre-fader, or they call it AFL, after the fader, okay? They haven't used PFL twice as in pre and post fader because it will always sound the same, PFL, PFL. So they use PFL and AFL, AFL after the fader. So usually these buttons are on the master section of the mixer where you control what the headphone output behavior is gonna, going to be. Same thing would be on the level. So you have a level meter on your, on your uh, mixer. It could be an analog meter, like a needle, or it could be a digital uh, LED level. Also, you can control that level to be your master output or your PFL, the pre-fader level when you solo. So when you hit the solo on, the level would be then only monitoring 
what's on that particular channel. So this way also you will be able to know if there's any clipping. So if there's any distortion or an overpowered input level on your mixer. So in that case, you lower your gain. Mentioning the gain here, some of the input channels would have a pad switch. The pad switch adds an attenuation of 20 decibels usually. So what happens, it lowers the input an extra 20 decibels and that is very suitable to high input sources like keyboards, like digital effects from guitars, or uh, it could be any uh, uh, kind of signal that it's already amplified. So this way you not really need the preamp the way you need it with the microphone. So what happens here, you lower your gain down to zero, add the pad, and then if the level is not enough, just increase the gain just to get the right output in respect to your level as well. So you check it with the PFL level. And when you are close to minus six, this is where you are fine to stop. I always uh, adjust uh, I always adjust my inputs to be at minus six. I don't like to adjust it to be exactly at zero decibels. This way you give a bit more dynamic range for the for the musician. So what happens if he plays softer or harder, you give him room. If you adjust it at zero decibels, anytime he plays harder, you're gonna get distortion and clipping. Even minus 10 decibels, still considered to be safe. The reason why is you still have equalization to be done. Equalization is gonna add more boost or might cut. So minus 10 gives you room about three to five decibels more in terms of headroom before uh, you limit your dynamic range on your musician. Now, finally here, we have our fader. Now, a rule of thumb is when you start initiating your mixes on your desk, start with your fader up at zero decibels and your master fader on zero decibels. We mentioned that before in the gain structure, but I'll repeat that again here. It's one of the very frequent mistakes that a lot of engineers do is that they start their fader half the way down, just like here in the picture. This is a generic picture. It's not intended to be as a reset or as a, as a uh, guideline to where your fader is supposed to be. A lot of the people, they use their speakers half the way down, the master fader half the way down, and their channel half the way down and start setting up their gain. This is one of the most uh, uh, frequent errors that uh, some engineers do. You need to make sure that you are setting up your gain on your maximum level. So your speaker is on zero decibels. That means maximum master fader on zero and your input fader which is on the channel itself also on zero and then you set up your gain until you get adequate output that you're happy with this way that means this level is where is your show level is if you have any issues that you need to boost the gain and getting feedback you can isolate that with the equalization but i always advise before you even start to equalize try to reposition the microphone. Repositioning the microphone is very important. It kind of helps you getting your maximum gain before feedback, and then the equalization helps you to eliminate it completely. So during the show, you will definitely have no issues. Now let's move into digital mixing channel strips. The major difference between digital mixers and analog is that the digital mixers were able to embed a lot of the outboard gear to be part of the surface. So if you remember when I talked about the inserts or channel inserts, this is where a lot of the uh, old days they used to get the, the analog racks or even the digital effects to be uh, uh, embedded or to be kind of enclosed within your, with your mixer. So the most common thing that all the engineers used were gates and compressors. Some of them, they expanded that to be gates compressors and expanders in some cases. Now a gate with a compressor together kind of works like an expander in some ways, but sometimes they used separate units, units to be uh, used so they can actually have more control. Uh, but again, the most basic and the thing that you find in every digital mixer nowadays is gates and compressors. A digital mixer without gates and compressors is pretty much a very entry level 
uh, unit. And in that case, I would not even uh, find it useful as a digital mixer. But today I find most, if not all, even small digital mixers to have gates and compressors on. Now, I will demo that on my uh, digital mixer here that I'm using. So I'm gonna bring in the control uh, interface for that digital mixer. This channel here on mic number one, this is my microphone I'm using here, it's a KSM-8. So uh, the once you select a channel here with a mouse, it will open me the relevant window that controls that channel. So you can see I have uh, uh, my input gain. You can see the level relevant to it. You can see the mic the compressor behavior. So I have a kind of a bit of a compression added to it. So when I step away from the mic, I will not get any kind of a loss in audio since I move sometimes to bring something from the table. And uh, there's a very minor equalization I've done in the room here. Now that here on the top is very much showing me parts of my channel strip. But what I'm seeing here is a typical channel strip that I've explained previously in an analog mixer. So I can see my input stage. I can see my polarity. I can control even my phantom power here. I forgot to mention phantom power. Usually it's on the back of the mixers. Some mixers on, in the analog world, they have the phantom power button right next to the XLR. So you just press that button to engage the phantom power if you want to use uh, condenser microphones. Uh, I will have my insert here. So if I drop down here, I can insert any of my effects into my uh, chain here, or I can use that on my sense. So this is where my auxiliaries are. So I have auxes, eight, uh, I have six auxes, sorry, and I have four. Uh, sends or internal auxiliaries for my effects. Now, this is my first input here. Of course, because this has a USB interface, so it can be used for USB, I can trigger my USB channel input here and switch between my analog interface to my digital recording interface by pressing that. Not all digital mixers have this, so this is not a rule. Now, most of the modern mixers right now, they added interfaces to them to be able to use them in studios or even to record your live performances. But this is not a rule. The first thing that comes after the gain structure is the noise gate, or we call them gates. This helps in reducing any background noise. All you need to do is increase the threshold here to where the noise level is. So if I stop talking right now for a second, Minus 60 is where my noise is. So anything above that would help reducing the noise. So if I put it right now, just around, let's say 65 or 55, uh, I'll put it on 50. Now, when I engage my noise gate, you can see that the red gate is closing down in which it actually eliminates the noise. Now, this is not only for noise gate, this is where the unwanted signal as well is needed to be filtered out. So when you play a snare in an enclosed room, the echo in the room takes some time to decay. And sometimes you don't need that. Sometimes you need your snare to be dry, especially with guys who record hip hop music or funk. You want your snare to be really tight. So what you need to do here, you increase the noise gate to be really tight. So you increase the threshold up in which it cuts the signal as soon as the signal decays by minus six to minus 10 de decibels. So this helps to tighten up the signal. Of course, now I'm not enabling it, so it's not gonna cut off my, my audio, but if I enable it, my audio will be very choppy, okay? Now, some mixers would add here in the noise gate, something called a deesser. A deesser is used to reduce the S's, the billions in, in, in words, which is uh, kind of adds a lot of saturation and it's very unwanted. But that would, in that case, not have a noise gate anymore. So it's either a noise gate or a deesser. Now, sometimes you need to choose between these two. Some mixers would have 
more options to add that as an insert. So instead of losing your noise gate, you can insert a deesser in your channel strip here. And then if you have a vocalist, especially with uh, a female vocalist or even male vocalist uh, in a speech, especially with MCs, you don't want that S to be, you know, penetrating through the mix and, and, and becoming very sharp. What happens is that a deesser is a kind of a compressor. We explained that, of course, in the in the webinar that is related to compression. And what happens when the any words that contains an S C H, S H uh, or even uh, sometimes an F is F, it might contain some wind blows in that case. What happens? It ducks it down. It compresses it and reduces that. Next in the chain, we will have our equalizers. And if I tap on my equalizer here, I'll have the controls. Of course, on the top here, I'll have more controls over my gate. So in my channel here, I see everything. Quick controls are here. But if I want to go with more controls, if it's a touch surface, as in a screen on your mixing desk, if you tap on the gate anywhere in the gate space here, it will enable the gate controls. This way, it gives you more control over the range. So that means how much you want the background noise to be leaking through. So when the gate is off, nothing will happen. But when the gate is engaged, how much closure is it applying? So how much background noise is left? This enables the sound to be smoother when the gate is engaged. It will not sound very choppy and it will sound more musical to your ears, okay? You can choose the kind of uh, gate you wanted. You wanted the ducking gate, a ducking gate usually is used with MCs. If I'm an MC and I have a background music, instead of keeping my hand on the fader and lowering the music down, I use a ducking gate in which it will affect a certain channel. So if I'm playing back music from my DJ, I'm a DJ and I'm doing MCing, the moment I speak, it lowers the music down, okay? Or a normal gate. An expander here would work as a gate compressor together. What happens is when the signal is enabled from the gate, it enables it to a certain limit by setting the ceiling up. So that's where the expanders are. We will talk about those in details in uh, the uh, in the compression or in the compressors uh, webinar. There is an envelope here where you control how the gate engages. So what happens? You want the gate to be instant, you want it to be a soft engaging, you want it to hold for a certain time, you want it to decay slowly. This is where the gate, the gate envelope is. And there's a side chain filter which can be used either to work as a deesser or to be used as a key input. So how the gate is triggered. An example would be if I'm playing drums and I'm gating my kick, so it will not pick up the snare. What I will do here, I will make the gate sensitive to certain frequencies only, which is in the lower register. So if I go on my equalizer here, lower register, which I'm talking about anything below 200 Hertz. So what happens here, if I play my snare, it will not trigger the gate on my kick to open. So when I'm playing kick, snare, kick, snare, the snare is played away from the kick. So that means the kick, will not affect my snare and the snare will not affect my kick. So this is a way, one of the techniques to eliminate leaks. Going back to the channel strip in the digital world, we have now the equalization. We've spoken about equalization last week. The first thing, we have a low cut. So the low cut here uh, will show which frequency will be engaged onwards or which frequencies are eliminated from my uh, channel strip. So since I'm using this channel right now for vocals, uh, I don't need anything below 80 Hertz. So my channel uh, or even 100. So you can see that my uh, high pass filter actually is at 57, but I can actually easily increase that to be close to 80 Hertz without hurting anything. So uh, that is my high pass filter. Next will be your low, low mids, high mids and high just like what we explained last week. Uh, so uh, I'm notching out 100 hertz. 
to kind of uh, get rid of the uh, cooling fan of my computer, which is kind of close to me here. Uh, and aside from this, everything else is super flat. I can actually increase the highs just a little bit to add a bit of sparkle to my voice maybe. So it'll be more clear in that case, or I can just keep it flat without anything. Now, since I'm using a KSM8 and a KSM8 is a flat microphone, I would actually keep the highs slightly up by a few decibels and that would not hurt at all. Now, that is the equalization part. You can enable the real-time analyzer, RTA. That will show me how the frequency response is going on. Not all the mixers have these, but most of the modern mixers, at least in the past five to six years, they have an RTA analyzer on them. Some of them would have a control over a pre or post. So this is the pre-RTA, this is the post. And some of them would have even the spectrum. So spectrum, real-time analyzer. This way it will show me uh, the, uh, the signal strength at certain frequencies. So those are in red. That means this is where it's close to the maximum here. So this is where my most peaks are. But that can be a bit confusing, and, and usually in terms when you have feedback, so when you have a certain tone, uh, the RTA would show that in a fixed peak, so it's very easy for you to slide your EQ on it and cut it out. So if you lack ear training and, or you want to just use your visual uh, uh, ways to catch where the uh, feedback is happening, the RTA is very useful. Next in the chain here, um, we have our compressor. A compressor has a specific uh, uh, usage. The simple thing about compressors is that it limits the maximum output of that channel strip, but also it enhances the lower signals. So it kind of balances the dynamic range, makes it narrower, and that helps in keeping the sound more consistent. So if you have parts in the song that is soft, instead of pushing the gain up or your fader up and causing feedback, the compressor actually reshapes that. But whenever the musician plays normally or hard, it also reduces that. So the compressor is a way to control dynamics. You have ability to control the mix between no compression, this is without compression right now, and this is with the compressor, 100%. I can use a balance of 50-50, so half compression, half dry signal so this way it keeps it more smoother you have presets to use with certain uh, instruments so let's say i'll switch to that channel right now i have a kick i can just put kick and say yes load that compressor here it automatically loads a preset that is suitable to the kick and then you can start tweaking that you have vocals i go on a vocal channel and i hit vocals and it will give me a vocal preset and that applies as well to the gate so i want a vocal gate i can do that I want a vocal, uh, sorry, a snare compressor. I can just go snare and I'm done. So this way you can find that your gate already is set up. It's a quick way to also learn digital mixers, especially when you when you use the entry-level digital mixers. This digital mixer I'm using right now is the MR18. It's uh, from a company called Midas. They have a very uh, useful digital mixer that is uh, very friendly for live and studio environments. So I can use that to run my webinars whenever I need to demo my microphones, plug it up into a, one of the preamps and have a handy solution that helps me uh, share my uh, knowledge with the users. Now, uh, after the gates and compressors here, we have our sends. So this way, uh, for example, to be able to send my microphone input to the webinar right now for you guys to hear me, I need to send my microphone here to these two buses, which is going to the webinar interface. So for example, these are my auxiliaries. But if I wanna use something else as a other recorder, I can, uh, for example, use bus five and six or four and five and send the same signal to those and be able to record it. If I wanna use any kind of effects like a reverb or something like this, all I need to do is use that and send that up. And this way it will send the signal to the reverb. So the way to do that, you need to make sure that you have already set your effects. So if I go on my effect channel here, 
I can check, for example, I have a vintage room, uh, which is like a kind of a reverb. I can set it to be inserted or just leave it as it is. So that means it's on my effects one. If I put my effects one up, so that means this is how much of my effect is going to my main channel. But now if I select my effects here and increase the amount of effect and increase my uh, effect output here, this way it will go to the effect unit and it will be engaged on the output. Once I disable it, it's not going to the effects anymore. <clears throat> now this is, of course, you need to make sure that your sense is engaged as well. So that's a separate topic here, which is the effect and how to use effects. So we'll have also a dedicated webinar to talk about effects. So this is where the sense is. And finally, uh, you cannot use that in a matrix form or just use that in a normal form. So you can do also pre and post fader. So that is something quite important is to select where you want your effect to be from. Most of the times post fader is doable. So that means depends on how much level I have after my fader. Now my fader is down here because I don't want my speakers to feed back into the microphone here. So I lowered it, but you can see that my uh, effect is post fader, but my other sends are pre fader. Okay, so if I go back to my main here and uh, let me just go back to the effects. Okay. Okay, so back to my main channel here. Uh, if I'm if I'm looking at my if my sends here generally, my aux sends, I have auxiliary sends separated from my effect sends. And the reason why is that they are both treated differently. So for example, for the webinar right now, I'm doing a pre-fader send. The reason why is that I want to be able to reduce my volume without cutting the sound that is going to you. But if I'm using something which I'm gonna come to explain right now, which is called the DCA or the groups, now, if I'm using the digital control amplifier to control certain outputs, which is, for example, I have spent my whole uh, sound check during my drum kit. If I want to adjust the sound of the drums in the middle of the show, I won't be able to do a number of eight faders together with the same balance. So what I do here, I put those on a group channel. So you can see here, there's number two on them. That means it's relevant to my second DCA. So now if I do this, I lower the whole drum sound separately, all together. And if I increase it, it does the same. If I go on channel on DCA number two, uh, number one, this one, this is only for instruments. So that means, let's say my keys and bass will be controlled separately from the drums and vocals. But then if I go on DCA number four, this will control the vocal group. So now if I reduce this, it will reduce the vocal group separately. So if I have group, if I have a main singer, uh, the, the, the choir or the, the, the backing vocalist, and I'll control those separately from the instruments, then I can put that. Now here, what it affects as well, it will affect the wet and dry mix. If you are sending a post fader uh, to the effect. So if this is my effect here, and I'm sending a post fader, of course, nothing is going to happen right now because it's a post fader. But if I do that as a pre fader, that will change completely. So now, if I go back to my sends here and I select that to be, you can see here they are segregated. My auxiliaries have a post EQ and it's a pre fader, while my effects are post fader. And since my fader is down, nothing is happening on the effect. But the moment I put it as a pre fader, now you're gonna start hearing uh, my reverb. So now I'm sending the signal to the effects here. And if I go on my effect channel here and I increase that up, then you will be able to hear my, uh, sorry, this one. This way you are able to hear my effects. So you can hear the echo quite clearly. 
But if I put that on post fader, now it's back to dry again. So what happens here is if if I keep it on uh, post fader, when I reduce the the reverb uh, on my DCA, if my send to, if my sends to the reverb are on my pre fader, what will happen? You will reduce the dry signal from the mains, but you're going to keep the uh, the, uh, the the effect or the what signal. So this is something very important. When you use DCAs, you need to make sure it's on post fader and not on pre fader. Okay. Now back again to our channel strip here. So I don't need effect, so let me take it off. And I'll be back on my main left and right. The last thing that I want to talk about here is in my uh, channel strip here, which is the main output stage, which is the the matrix or where you control the groups. So I was talking about how you work out the groups and channels. And you always select that here. You also have something called the mute groups. So if you want to mute the instruments all in one or you want to mute the instruments instead of going to every individual channel, let's say you have 32 channels and the show is over or the speech is over and you want to unmute the band. If it will take you time to unbutton or unpress all these buttons, it's quite tedious. So what you do, you select the channels and you select which mute group you want. So let's say I'll put my drums all on mute group number one. So now if I press number one here, it will mute my drums only separately. Number two will mute my instruments. So you can see that my keys and bass is on number two. If I go on number three, I have nothing, but if I go on number four, that will mute uh, the vocals. So if I go here, that will mute, for example, sorry, number three is muting vocals. I didn't add number one here on the vocals, so I'll not be muted while I'm talking to you. But let's say number four is my backing track or my track from Cubase, for example. So when I do this, it mutes it. So you can see right now that with a single button here, I'm able to mute most of my channels. So let's say when the show starts, all I need to do one, two, three, four, done. But if you calculate how many channels I have here, it's way more than four buttons. Same thing, I can access my DCAs, which is my main group channels right away from here. So what happens here, it eliminates a lot of flipping in the pages. So instead of going flipping and wondering where your channels is, because most of the mixers do not have a space to accommodate all your faders in front of you to be able to visually see them. In big studios, you have the mixing desks scattered over the space because they have all their sweet time to do it. But in live gigs, you have no time. If something goes wrong, you need to access it really quick. So most of the digital mixers, they would have the DCAs or some people call them VCAs as well, on the center of the console. This is where you access everything from there. And if you need to individually adjust the mix, so if you want to adjust the mix of the drums individually, let's say the snare is a bit louder in the whole drum mix, then you go down to your channels here and you adjust the snare separately. But then your group channel for the drums would adjust the overall mix of the drums within the whole band. Now, all these controls are done in your main output. Also, you are able to control what goes on your output. If you want to go to the stereo output or you want to keep it under the surface and use it only into the auxiliaries. So if I'm using a talkback microphone, I use that usually without going on the main PA. I only want to talk to the band. So I disable the main stereo output here and I will only send that to the stage monitors or the in-ears. So this way, when I pick up the microphone from the desk, people on the outside will not hear what I'm talking to the band. So that will stay as a fold back system communication. Of course, in that case, it will be one way. Also, you have the the panorama or what you call it, the, the panning uh, control. So this way you can control where is that channel going to go on your stereo field. In mixers where you have a 5.1 output, it becomes a joystick. So this way you can control front center, center, 
all the speakers, front, left, front, right, middle, or rear, depends on how your speaker configuration is. But to keep it simple, 90% of the mixers would use a pan left and right. So the panorama here will be either right or left or how much you want to control that. So if I go, for example, on my overheads, you can see that I panned this microphone to the right and this one to the left. But when it comes to vocals, I keep it centered. Bass, I keep it centered. Keys, if it's a mono input, I keep it centered. If it's stereo, I will pan the dual input from the keys and to be coming a left and right. You can do an auto mixer. Some, some mixers would have an auto mixer. So this mixer has two channels auto mix. So let's say we have two vocals. I want the computer to, or the mixer to be able to mix those without an overlap. So whenever the speaker is done talking, I want to mute his channel. And when he's speaking, I want to unmute it automatically. So I can use something called an auto mix. So this is an auto mixer. You select which one. So this is an X channel, and maybe that one will be the Y channel. And then in that case, the auto mixer would automatically mix these. The most known auto mixer in the industry is called the Dan Dugan mixer. Uh, sure built a advanced version of that. We call it the Sure and Telemix. This is a very advanced auto mixing that can be working on multiple amount of channels. So if you have eight microphones for a panel, it's very hard to control those in a normal situation, keeping your hands on the fader, lowering that speaker who is over, increasing the one that speaks. Keeping an eye contact is very hard. Sometimes you need to watch a video screen. So an auto mixer works really best in that case. One thing that is also uh, known in digital mixers is that you can have the ability to have a level control. You can see your inputs, your outputs, where the levels are setting. You can check your solo as well. So if I'm soloing my channel right now, you can see the solo level, which is your PFL level, okay? And if I solo my master here as well, it will do that, but that will go right away to the headphones output. So it's gonna, gonna show on the, uh, the output here. Uh, the effects, usually you have, uh, in digital mixers, you have visual uh, screens for the effects. So if you go on uh, the, uh, when I toggle the effect, now you can go into controls of it. This is a whole reverb, for example. You can select presets. So this is my, let's say the, uh, the chorus. If I wanna switch that to become something else, to be a wave designer. A wave designer then is kind of an envelope kind of filter. So every mixer has their list of effects and libraries accordingly. Most of the basic mixers would have a single effect unit. Uh, in analog world, they have a digital effect embedded into an analog mixer, but most of the digital mixers would have minimum two digital effects and up to four and maybe sometimes eight digital effects. Here also I have the ability to do a uh, graphic equalizer, I think. Yes, so there's a dual graphic equalizer. And then this enables me to control some of my uh, auxiliaries. So if I'm using auxiliaries on stage in wedges and I wanna eliminate feedback, so this way I can use a graphic equalizer just like I explained in the last webinar. So these can be used as an effect in an insert or inserted into the channel strip relevant to the auxiliary. Now, speaking about auxiliary channel strip, it's the same way if I go on my bus here. So that is my bus output. If I select that and I go on my channel right now, you can see that bus number one, which is my auxiliary number one, has a built-in compressor and a built-in equalizer. So if that equalizer is not capable to eliminate the leaks or the feedback on stage, I can insert into that channel here, back to the channel, I can insert here an effect from that relevant channel. So I think it's uh, it gives you only two effects here. So I have to put it either in effect A or B, and then this will be inserted here, and then I can do a very narrower selection of that particular frequency. Of course, the more you use mixers, the more hands-on, the more you learn how to use that. One final uh, feature in the digital mixers world is the ability to save 
presets. And that is extremely useful when you have multiple bands. So when I have four or five bands in the sound check, I can save that into a preset here and recall that later on. So then I don't have to recall uh, or fiddle around with my mixer so often. Sometimes you can even do that to songs. If I have a single band performing, I can even have scenes and I can have snapshots. So I can have a band name called X, song number one to eight, and I can recall every single song separately. So that means every song will have its own settings according to my sound check. Or I can just use a single preset if everything is the same in the band, then I'll do that. So these are things that you can do uh, over uh, in, in your practice. So uh, this brings us to the end of uh, the introduction to mixing desks. Um, I hope that was very informative to you guys. And um, this brings us to the last part of the webinar, which is the Q&A. Uh, you have a box on the right side uh, where you can actually, it says Q&A. You can put in any questions that you like, uh, any questions that you found that was not covered today. I'll be more than happy to answer this. Uh, in the final part here, I'd like you to uh, please uh, remember that these webinars are recorded. They are uh, sent afterwards on our YouTube channel. You can find it on Shore Mia on YouTube. So please subscribe, uh, follow our page on uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, you can add your comments there for anything that you'd like us to elaborate on or answer your questions separately. Uh, you can also follow my uh, Instagram page, which is uh, Barry at Shore, Barry underscore at underscore Shore. Uh, I do live streaming every week with different topics, those that either arise from questions or from uh, any other topics that comes to my head. It's a very uh, casual live streaming. I do it from the same spot in the studio. Uh, so... Uh, please uh, follow me on that page and uh, feel free to hit me up with any subject that you have. Uh, finally, uh, there are way more topics that's gonna come up. Uh, there will be uh, a mega webinar happening soon about microphone techniques. It'll be about uh, how to mic uh, guitar amplifiers and electric guitars. So please stay tuned to our webinars and uh, make sure that you are subscribe to our newsletter and uh, to latest information related to our webinars. Uh, there is a question. Let me just check that up and see. So, perfect. So the question is about what snapshot does on a mixer. So a snapshot is where you uh, capture all the details of the mixer. So if I go back to my mixer here, uh, let me just share the screen. Uh, I think that's here. And okay, here's the mixer. So here we have a snapshot. And in the snapshot, you can select what you want to be recalled. And that is actually a, uh, it's a good tool to segregate songs from a preset. So when I when I when I load a preset, it will load the whole settings. But if I want to do different settings for that same uh, preset, so remember when I mentioned the example? Sorry, I think I didn't share the screen. Let me go back again. Yes, sorry. So this is a snapshot. So this is my mixer here. I can save that as a scene or a channel preset. So let me see. I saved it as a scene. Okay. So that means. I've saved it as a uh, as a song, but if I want to load a whole band, okay, I will save that as a snapshot. And within the snapshot, I can change the scenes. So it's like a sub preset to that global preset. Back in the days, uh, mixers had only scenes. You cannot do snapshots, okay? Or it only had sorry, it, yeah, it had only scenes and not snapshots, but Later on, some mixers had the two layers of, of recalls. So you have the, the scene, and then you have snapshot, snapshots within the, screen, within the scenes. So that means I, if I have four bands, then I have four scenes, and each band can have separate sub 
presets for every single song. So you can simply call it a sub preset and you can just segregate between them. Every manufacturer does it differently in the way you recall or load those. Uh, some uh, manufacturers do backups. So if you lost power or somebody messed up with your uh, save the scene or snapshot, you can recall those from backups. That is quite useful in this way you will not waste any of your sound checks. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, are there any more questions? Okay. So uh, since there are no questions so far, uh, I hope that you had a very good information today and it uh, added a lot to your experience. For those who uh, feel a bit confused about mixing desks, I strongly recommend you to uh, uh, visit any place where they have, like, a, I mean, whenever shops are opened, hopefully, or when studios allow musicians to walk in and, and kind of do their sessions. Try to book sessions where you plug in your iPod or your phone or your microphone and fiddle around with the desks. This is the most uh, valuable time that you can get into mixing desks. The moment you start sound checking or working with a band or recording, you are in a panic mode and you do not want to mess further with the desk, especially if you're not used to it. So you step away from fiddling with that desk. And with the, with the idea that there are presets and there are snapshots or fail or call a fail save preset for the desks, you have nothing to worry about and changing anything. You can fiddle around with whatever you want. And anytime you feel that you are lost, you can recall the channel to default and you're back again to where you are. And you can maneuver again and navigate where you went wrong. So, uh, I hope you guys had a good day and until the next webinar, I hope you stay healthy and safe. Take care and see you soon.